you think about uh, 1 Samuel, we're looking at 31 chapters in 1 Samuel. And then you look at 2 Samuel, and we're looking at 24 chapters. And so we're trying to cover a great deal of runway here, um, but we're doing it in a short period of time. But we're doing it all under the concept of the Old Testament simplified. And so uh, we look at these two books and what's being covered regarding an importance perspective, uh, as well as just a, a again, content perspective. There's a lot here, uh, but it's all about Jesus coming, and it's all about God's eternal purpose. And all of what we look at in the Old Testament is for our learning, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, and uh, we are reminded and have recalled almost in all of our studies together as we're looking at the Old Testament that we are able to grow in our fear. In other words, we're able to grow in our wisdom of God uh, and our understanding that um, he has granted us salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And so, um, why is it that we have what we have? Why is it that pieces are pulled out the way that they are? Um, why is it that certain areas are covered and studied in more depth and more detail than others? Uh, because ultimately, God knows us as his creation. He knows um, how to work within our minds, within the way our minds function. Um, and ultimately, all of these verses lead us to Jesus. And so other aspects of these time periods and uh, various situations of rule, um, back and forth regarding uh, power and polit po you know, po politics, economic ups and downs, those kinds of things, are not interesting to us or relevant to us because ultimately what we're looking for is how to grow in godliness and how we can have eternal life. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. And so um, think of that as we're going through this and as we're kind of highlighting the, the main characters and uh, the different aspects of the text. And obviously we're going to drive that home uh, toward the end of this class as we're looking at uh, the Davidic covenant. And so uh, let's continue on. Uh, we, I think, stopped with Saul uh, last class, and that's under uh, letter A, <clears throat> their content, uh, number A, number 8, and then uh, letter, subletter, lowercase b, Saul. Uh, I think we finished that up, so now we're getting into David. Um, and again, this is difficult because we could spend a whole lot of time talking about David, um, but we're looking at it again from the context was, as was introduced and, and mentioned. David was the second and greatest king of Israel. Uh, he was faithful to God and a man after God's own heart. And we see that in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, as well as what is recalled regarding David in the New Testament in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. And so you look at, first of all, 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14. Here we have Saul's unlawful sacrifice. Um, and this is where uh, Samuel tells Saul, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And then, of course, we see also more um, words regarding Saul no longer having the kingdom in the 15th chapter. The 15th chapter, uh, you look at verse 28, Samuel says to him, and again, this is after Saul disobeyed God regarding the Amalekites. Look at verse 2 of chapter 15. Um, he was supposed to destroy them. He did not. Um, this is, remember, where Samuel tells Saul, hey, to obey is better than sacrifice, as Saul was coming up with excuses as to why he didn't obey God. Hey, we were going to sacrifice it to the Lord. Who cares that he told us to destroy it all? Um, no, to obey is better than sacrifice. Well, verse 28 Samuel then says to him, what's the consequence? The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that should relent. Uh, then he said, Saul, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. And Samuel turned back after Saul 
Saul worshipped uh, the Lord. And so now all of a sudden, basically Saul's sorry. What kind of sorrow, what kind of sorrow are we talking about? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. This is not godly sorrow. He's not truly sensitive of his sin, uh, although he acknowledges it. What is he sor- sorry about? Hey, uh, the consequence. He's lost the kingdom. Um, and it's interesting as well, you think about here the time period. How long does it take for Saul to lose power? I mean, we first see that he's going to lose power here, uh, and who is going to be granted it, um, a man after God's own heart. First Samuel 13, verse 14. Um, takes a long time, though, Saul to lose power. It doesn't just happen overnight. Um, and, and even David then coming on the scene, and you see David and Goliath in chapter 17, uh, and then throughout the book, I mean, Saul is constantly on pursuit of David. You'd think he'd wake up and say, you know, the Lord has declared I'm no longer going to be ruler. Maybe I should, maybe I should just step down, but uh, no, he, he doesn't. Um, and so David was faithful to God. He was a man after God's own heart. He went from a shepherd boy to a great military hero to king over Israel. Yet in all his power, he did not forget God as Saul had. And so that's really the difference. Um, you think about uh, Nathan coming to David in 2 Samuel uh, regarding David's sin regarding Uriah and Bathsheba, uh, chapter 11, and then chapter 12, when that was brought to the attention of David. Uh, And then you think about Psalm 51. David was penitent. And I think sometimes we kind of just, you know, at least I have, kind of overlooked that. Oh, it's, you know, it's it's what David should have done. It's good. But again, think about Saul. (laughs) And think about the way he responded. And think about his reaction. And think about his continual quest and pursuit of power kind of holding on to it, and his worldly sorrow versus his godly sorrow. Really, the way David responded is indeed unique. I'm not saying that, again, it's okay that David sinned and did what he did. He shouldn't have done that. But his response and his reaction is really what's what's impressive. Um, We're all going to sin. Uh, All accountable people have sinned uh, and will sin. Um, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 um, but the question is how we respond, how we react. Uh, how do we go forward given that sin? And that's really what's interesting about David. Um, and I say that because sometimes people will pile on David. Um, you know, why is David lifted up? Why is he esteemed? Why do we think David's so wonderful? Um, well, it's fascinating given his status. Uh, and the fact that he could have responded in a physically centric way uh, that caused him to commit those sins and then reacted in such a way, but instead he chose a different path. Uh, And it would seem, by the way, that his son did as well, uh, Solomon. Um, You look at the book of Proverbs, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon seems to come to the conclusion that his ways of living regarding his concubines and his strange wives wasn't the way to go. Uh, he, he, he fell short. And so um, that's, that's unique. Uh, and obviously, as we think about those that are in power today, uh, you think about the British monarchy, you think about presidents, you think about senators, um, you think about the corruption that exists regarding those who are in power. Um, David had plenty of room to be corrupt. But yet, the indication that we get in the Bible is opposite. He, he was sensitive to the Lord's commands and his ways uh, and um, sought them and pursued them. Um, and again, wasn't, wasn't perfect, uh, had sin, and so wasn't a savior. Ultimately, we need Christ but uh, still one that we can look up to. David learned, again, from his sins and had the humility to come back to God and repent, again, Bathsheba, as well as Uriah. Uh, David, at one point, was a liar, deceiver, adulterer, and murderer, but he had the presence of mind to repent when his sins were pointed out to him. David's life may may be divided into his tests, triumphs, troubles, and testimonies. Um, I think David here is what you could call spiritually intelligent. You know, 
our society today is very interested in emotional intelligence, um, being emotionally in tune with our surroundings. And I think David is someone who was spiritually intelligent. Um, he, was, he was willing to allow his spiritual senses uh, concerning what he knew regarding God and his commands to be activated and to be lived by. Um, and again, you see that especially as you think about uh, Nathan uh, and his Psalm 51, his willingness to uh, be contrite and to be uh, humbled regarding his, his state. So any comments on David or Saul or just the dynamic here of these kings and these rulers? Amen. Amen. And regarding the Solomon connection again as well, you think about David's example. Psalm 51 was the Solomon too. I mean, Solomon had that as well. And uh, you think about parenting and you think about the progression of that spiritual intelligence, that sensitivity to God's commands. Um, Solomon had an example in David, not only as king, not only as ruler, not only regarding instructions, but also again, um, how to respond to failure. And again, from a parental perspective, this is a wake-up call for a lot of folks. Um, you know, sometimes parents get frustrated with their children and, and are frustrated about uh, their inability to, to have that heart that is sensitive and that is moldable and that is um, willing to yield when yet the parents have never admitted fault to the children. Not that they have to, but in other words, when they have failed, they haven't said, hey, this was my fault. I, I failed here. Um, David set the example for Solomon in that respect as well. And humility is really a huge aspect uh, regarding who he was, especially as you think about compared to Saul. Uh, think about how Samuel describes Saul uh, concerning his former state prior to him being so stubborn and unwilling to obey the commandments of God. If you look at um, 1 Samuel again, chapter 15, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, and notice there in verse 17, Samuel says to him, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was, not, uh, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? In other words, Saul, you've, come, you've become too big for your britches. You've you started to think that you're something mighty and great, and you're an authority in and of yourself. You're self-righteous. 
Uh, that's not the state you were in when God elevated you to king. At one time, you were little in your own sight. And so, again, David went through this same difficulty uh, regarding just how he perceived himself. Obviously, you, you just think about what he did regarding Uriah. I mean, how many different ways he tried to manipulate that situation to clear himself of any wrongdoing. And he did so because of the power that he had amassed, and he thought he was capable of pulling that off. But yet he didn't. And what happens when he becomes aware of it? He becomes little in his own sight. He, in other words, he finally humbles himself. He realizes the, you know, the state that, that he is in and his dependence on God. And absolutely this speaks to us. Um, God sees our heart, right? Just as uh, God will tell Samuel in chapter 16 of verse 7 of 1 Samuel. Man looks on the outside, but God sees the inside. In other words, a willingness to be right with God, the heart being right, if that is truly pursued, you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure it out. Um, as a matter of fact, we even have verses in the New Testament that lay this out for us pretty clearly. Uh, you think about uh, John chapter 7 in verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. If any man desire to do my will, if any man is fixated and says, I want to be right with God, that is my focus, that is my north star, that is my purpose in this life. Jesus says, you're going to know it. You, you will find that out. Um, you think also about the words that he says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, regarding searching, seeking, pursuing, um, knocking, asking, so that we can be right with him. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to you, uh, to them that ask him? Uh, if you want to be in God's kingdom, and you want to be right with him, Stephen led the song Wednesday, God will make a way. God will make a way. Um, and so, uh, yes, David was little in his own sight. Uh, David had the right heart. Um, great, great account that we could dive into even further. Let's go to Eli. Eli was the high priest. Um, he reared young uh, Samuel in the house of the Lord. His sons were wicked, eventually killed by the Philistines as a punishment from God. Again, we looked at that last week as we were also looking at Samuel. Um, questioned whether or not Samuel picked up some of his parenting um, tactics from Eli, given uh, Samuel's two sons. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 3. Um, it's interesting to see that, but that at the same time you also see here are holy men of God serving, uh, and yet their, their children have chosen a different path. So there's two ways really you could look at that. Question the parenting style, and questioning you know whether or not they could have done things differently, um, and how well they train their children. But then also, you can also take away from it: Hey, here are two uh, servants of the Lord whose children went astray. Uh, after Eli heard his sons were dead, and the ark of the covenant had been taken, he fell backwards and died. First Samuel chapter four, verses twelve through eighteen. He judged Israel for forty years. First Samuel four, four and verse eighteen. Uh, and then we have Nathan. Nathan was a faithful prophet to God. He was a close friend to David. He's first mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and verse 2, advising David concerning the construction of the temple. Uh, he appeared to David after his sin with Bathsheba and compelled him to repent. And again, we've already talked about this and looked at the wisdom as Nathan is inspired of God to uh, present this, this parable of the lamb uh, to David. 
uh, and just the value of being able to bring leaders to identify their own shortcomings by presenting them a situation where they're willing to identify the shortcomings of others. And frankly, I've seen it done in several contexts, and it works. Um, it doesn't always bring them to make the right decision, but it, uh, it will work. Um, at the birth of Solomon, Nathan came to name the child. In the last years of David, Nathan with Bathsheba secured the succession of Solomon and by the king's request assisted in his inauguration. Uh, then we have Jonathan, another beautiful uh, account that we could really spend a lot of time on, an account that I think um, in many ways is extremely valuable, especially in today's time. Uh, for example, we talked about Wednesday regarding this, quote, epidemic of men and men in this country and kind of the backwards direction men are going in concerning development and improvement uh, from an economic perspective, from an educational perspective, leadership perspective. And remember, the senator pointed out Bible verses as to how we could get back as a country to being how we ought to be. But you also think about friendship and male friendships and male um, companionship as it relates to iron sharpening I iron, um, the, the value of, of that kind of bond uh, as it relates to, um, you know, a bromance, if you will. That's kind of what you have here with Jonathan and David. It's a, it's a wonderful story of friendship. Um, he's the eldest son of Saul, king of Israel. So right there, I mean, <laughs> the fact that he would even be friends with David is interesting. Uh, but he was, and he was loyal to David. Um, aware of, of um, again, I think David's heart and, and what, who David was compared to his own father, uh, valuable. Uh, Jonathan is presented as a great friend to David. He pleaded with his father Saul on several occasions on behalf of David. Uh, the two friends made several covenants with one another because of their mutual love and loyalty. Uh, the relationship of David and Jonathan is a high point in the book. Uh, any other comments or thoughts on these on these final points. No? All right. Um, and so, just briefly here, the context, uh, Book of First and Second Samuel provide a sequel to Judges and Ruth. Um, so you're, you're in the period of the Judges. Ruth, you're looking at a, you know, drill down period within that period. Uh, and then you're getting into First and Second Samuel. What are you looking at? You're transitioning from Judges to now the period of the Kings. Um, so pretty significant. Uh, and it covers, um, let's see, 1100 B.C. to 970 B.C., including the lifespans of Eli, Samuel, reigns of Saul, and David, each who reigned 40 years. Um, and then we get into this piece of the covenants, and this is really where kind of it's the 20,000-foot view Larry mentioned earlier. This is kind of why we're studying this book the way that we are. Uh, the primary of physical, uh, the primary or physical fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant come to pass at this point. Um, what was that covenant? He promised Abraham seed, um, and we see that happening. And um, remember, even at the time when that was, when that was promised, uh, it was, it was and, and Abraham and Sarah even thought it to be unlikely that it would come to pass, but it did. Uh, and they expanded and grew greatly within, uh, of course, Egypt. Uh, then there's the land promise. Um, which we have seen come to fulfillment as well. And then there's the nation promise, and this is where it really kind of culminates, because now having a king and, and having this official kind of kingship, you know, it's really completed now. It's been, it's been fulfilled um, in, in the limited sense. Uh, now we're looking at the ultimate fulfillment, which is Christ, that seed is the ultimate seed, uh, the church, and heaven. And so again, the, the nation land. What is it really? It's spiritual again. That's the, that's the thing. Third covenant is made with David, and that's what we're about to look into, and the seed promise is referred to in 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 51. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22, you remember that chapter. Um, David, uh, speaking to the words, speaking spoke to the Lord the words of this song 
on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Verse 51, he is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. And then David, of course, goes on to give his last words in chapter 23. And so let's look at the Davidic covenant then. Um, and this is, by the way, on page 64, looking at the primary and then the ultimate f- fulfillment. And so the promise, God's seed promise. Uh, let's go to the text. If someone can read for me, 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16. Thank you, brother, so much. And so uh, the seed promise, um, you see that being fulfilled uh, within Solomon, uh, from, again, from the limited or the initial primary perspective. Um, David's words to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3. Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. You may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. And so uh, Solomon continued on uh, that, that seed. Uh, who is the ultimate fulfillment? Um, well, it's got to be obviously beyond Solomon, because if you look at, going back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, verse 16, uh, the house and the kingdom would be established for, um, forever before you. And so it was going to uh, be eternal. So where do we find that fulfillment? It's obviously in Jesus. Um, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, if someone could read for me verses 30 and 31. Luke chapter 1, 30 and 31. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. You and you shall call his name Jesus. All right, and then we also have Matthew's account um, regarding who Jesus was. The book of the gene, this is verse 1, chapter 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Uh, and I think we've looked at this before together. Um, you look at verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon until Christ are 14 generations. Probably Matthew was giving the Jewish people. Uh, a, a pattern there so that they could easily remember the breakdown of the genealogy to be able to recite how it is they knew Christ was the Messiah. But notice there the breakdown, Abraham to David, David to captivity, uh, son of David already being mentioned in verse 1. Notice there also in verse 20 as Joseph is being um, approached by the angel, Joseph, son of David. Uh, Joseph, son of David. And so, uh, emphasis here regarding who Jesus was connected to, his seed line, going back to David. Um, Again, for a society that focuses on monarchies, this is important. This is difficult for us as Americans because we want nothing to do with monarchies. We're not interested in kings. Um, But, I think from a pop culture perspective, uh, society has interest in 
people who have wealth and have power. You look at the Kennedy family, for example. You look at the Rockefeller family, the Rothschild family. Uh, you look at these powerful families that have existed um, and the way that they've kind of been esteemed and looked up to, and then what do people say? Oh, that is a child of whoever. Uh, but obviously, from a monarchy perspective, this is a big deal. Just look at what's happened with the monarchy more recently concerning marriage and who they marry and whether or not it's in line with monarchical blood and so forth and, and powerful blood. Um, drama gets created, and people care, right? Um, it, it matters in other parts of the world as to whether or not the monarchy bloodline matches. And so for us, we don't really put a whole lot of stock and understand really the significance of this because our culture just isn't based on it from a political perspective. But this is a huge deal. Uh, Christ is exactly who God has always been talking about. He spoke of him being of the seed of woman in the very beginning pages of the Bible. He spoke of him being of the seed of Abraham. He spoke of him being of the seed of David. And the reason why David is significant is because of royalty. Um, and so he is, of course, the king of kings. Um, God's king promise, uh, nation of Israel. Again, 1 Kings chapters 2 through 3, um, that uni unified nation. Um, and then uh, we see that ultimately being fulfilled as it relates to the church. Uh, we know that the church is the kingdom. Uh, Luke chapter 1 in verse 33, and he will reign over his house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Uh, by the way, there verse 32. I don't think he, yeah, he didn't include verse 32 in here, but um, that's where Luke says, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That's probably why he didn't, is because of the throne promise which is this third piece here regarding the Davidic covenant. Uh, the physical throne of Solomon, of course, physical. The spiritual throne of Jesus, where is that? Um, that is in heaven. And we see that he sits down at the right hand of God. If you look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 19, uh, and that is where he reigns. He reigns in heaven um, because that is where he is able to be both king and priest, because uh, he cannot be priest on earth, uh, because uh, the Lord did not authorize uh, priests under uh, Judah, but under Levi. Notice Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Uh, and then if you look over at chapter 8, um, verse 4, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. And so you've probably heard it been said before, you've probably even said before, when folks say, well, the Church of Christ, interesting, this is like one of the first things people will sometimes ask, where's y'all's headquarters? I mean, that's like, generally, you usually have a short conversation with folks, and usually that's a common question. Where's y'all's headquarters? And what is usually the response? Well, our headquarters is in heaven. Well, it's not just some cliche thing. I mean, it is. That is where our king is. That is where our government, our rule, uh, reigns, is in heaven above. Um, and so uh, there we have First and Second Samuel. Any other questions or thoughts on First and Second Samuel? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows, man? Uh, I probably heard it from someone else. I, I, uh, I someone asked, uh, if you know, Ben Shapiro, the comment that he wrote about the church and about you. Somebody asked him, why do you not believe Jesus is the Messiah? So his answer was, well, uh, you know, it's clear that um, uh, Jesus didn't fulfill the uh, purpose that is laid out in the 
Yeah. And folks will do it from a Jewish perspective and also from a Christian perspective where they take what's called moral authority. And when you look at the Old Testament from a physical perspective, you think you have the moral authority. In other words, the God-authorized authority to say the nation of Israel should exist. Power should be in that region. It should be protected. Money should flow into it. It should um, be rooted in geopolitical policy. Uh, and that, what does that do? That brings in this physical sphere of protection in a cocoon. But by the way, Christians, quote, will do the exact same thing. And they'll say that we have moral authority as Americans for this nation to continue. We have moral authority as a business person to be the leader. We have moral... Why? Because we are... Wait a second. Wait a second. What did Jesus do? Jesus was not elevated to king on this earth. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus suffered under the hands of those who had absolutely no moral authority. But yet he has all moral authority. And so what is our moral authority? Is it to beat our chest and say, we have every right to demand X, Y, and Z? No. Sometimes it's to suffer and be the sacrifice in the midst of those who have physical authority who would oppress us. Now, I'm not saying I want that. But the reality is we have to be aware of that so that we respond the right way as these challenging times come up because they, they, they are and they will continue. Uh, anyway, any other comments or thoughts? Thank you all very much.